So this is Animal Farm by George Orwell, chapter seven. It was a bitter winter. The stormy weather was followed by sleet and snow, and then by a hard frost, which did not break till well into February. The animals carried on as best they could with the rebuilding of the windmill, well knowing that the outside world was watching them and that the envious human beings would rejoice and triumph if the mill were not finished on time. Out of spite, the human beings pretended not to believe that it was Snowball who had destroyed the windmill. They said that it had fallen down because the walls were too thin. The animals knew that this was not the case. Still, it had been decided to build the walls three feet thick this time instead of 18 inches as before which meant collecting much larger quantities of stone. For a long time, the quarry was full of snowdrifts and nothing could be done. Some progress was made in the dry, frosty winter that followed, but it was cruel work and the animals could not feel so hopeful about it as they had felt before. They were always cold and usually hungry as well. Only Boxer and Clover never lost heart. Squealer made excellent speeches on the joy of service and the dignity of labor, but the other animals found their inspiration in Boxer's strength and his never failing cry of, I will work harder. In January, food fell short. The corn ration was drastically reduced and it was announced that an extra potato ration would be issued to make up for it. Then it was discovered that the greater part of the potato crop had been frosted in the clamps, which had not been covered thickly enough. The potatoes had become soft and discolored, and only a few were edible. For days at a time, the animals had nothing to eat but chaff and mangles. Starvation seemed to stare them in the face. It was vitally necessary to conceal this fact from the outside world. Emboldened by the collapse of the windmill, the human beings were inventing fresh lies about Animal Farm. Once again, it was being put down that all the animals were dying of famine and disease, and that they were continually fighting among themselves and had resorted to cannibalism and infanticide. Napoleon was well aware of the bad results that might follow if the real facts of the food situation were known, and he decided to make use of Mr. Wimper to spread a contrary impression. Hitherto, the animals had had little or no contact with Wimper on his weekly visits. Now, however, a few selected animals, mostly sheep, were instructed to remark casually in his hearing that rations had been increased. In addition, Napoleon ordered the almost empty bins in the store shed to be filled nearly to the brim with sand, which was then covered up with what remained of the grain and meal. On some suitable pretext, Wimper was led through the store shed and allowed to catch a glimpse of the bins. He was deceived and continued to report to the outside world that there was no food shortage on Animal Farm. Nevertheless, towards the end of January, it became obvious that it would be necessary to procure some more grain from somewhere. In these days, Napoleon rarely appeared in public, but spent all his time in the farmhouse, which was guarded at each door by fierce looking dogs. When he did emerge, it was in a ceremonial manner with an escort of six dogs who closely surrounded him and growled if anyone came too near. Frequently, he did not even appear on Sunday mornings, but issued his orders through one of the other pigs, usually Squealer. One Sunday morning, Squealer announced that the hens, who had just come in to lay again, must surrender their eggs. Napoleon had accepted through Wimper a contract for 400 eggs a week. The price of these would pay for enough grain and meal to keep the farm going till summer came on and conditions were easier. 
When the hens heard this, they raised a terrible outcry. They had been warned earlier that this sacrifice might be necessary, but had not believed that it would really happen. They were just getting their clutches ready for the spring sitting, and they protested that to take the eggs away now was murder. For the first time since the expulsion of Jones, there was something resembling a rebellion. Led by three young black Menorca pullets, the hens made a determined effort to thwart Napoleon's wishes. Their method was to fly up to the rafters and there and there lay their eggs, which mashed to pieces on the floor. Napoleon acted swiftly and ruthlessly. He ordered the hens' rations to be stopped and decreed that any animal giving so much as a grain of corn to a hen should be punished by death. The dogs saw to it that these orders were carried out. For five days, the hens held out. Then they capitulated and went back to their nesting boxes. Nine hens had died in the meantime. Their bodies were buried in the orchard, and it was given out they had died of cockadiosis. Wimper heard nothing of this affair, and the eggs were duly delivered a grocer's van driving up to the farm once a week to take them away. All this while, no more had been seen of Snowball. He was rumored to be hiding on one of the neighboring farms, either Foxwood or Pinchfield. Napoleon was by this time on slightly better terms with the other farmers than before. It happened that there was in the yard a pile of timber, which had been stacked there 10 years earlier, when a beech spinney was cleared. It was well seasoned and Wimper had advised Napoleon to sell it. Both Mr. Pilkington and Mr. Frederick were anxious to buy it. Napoleon was hesitating between the two, unable to make up his mind. It was noticed that whenever he seemed on the point of coming to an agreement with Frederick, Snowball was declared to be hiding at Foxwood while when he inclined toward Pilkington, Snowball was said to be at Pinchfield. Suddenly, early in the spring, an alarming thing was discovered. Snowball was secretly frequenting the farm by night. The animals were so disturbed that they could hardly sleep in their stalls. Every night, it was said, he came creeping in under the darkness and performed all kinds of mischief. He stole the corn, he upset the milk pails, he broke the eggs, he trampled the seed beds, he gnawed the bark off the fruit trees. Whenever anything went wrong, it became usual to attribute it to Snowball. If a window was broken or a drain blocked, someone was certain to say that Snowball had come in the night and done it. And when the key to the store shed was lost, the whole farm was convinced that Snowball had thrown it down the well. Curiously enough, they went on believing this even after the mislaid key was found under a sack of meal. The cows declared unanimously that Snowball crept into their stalls and milked them in their sleep. The rats, which had been troublesome that winter, were also said to be in league with Snowball. Napoleon decreed that there should be a full investigation into Snowball's activities. With his dogs in attendance, he set out and made a careful tour of inspection of the farm buildings, the other animals following at a respectful distance. At every few steps, Napoleon stopped and snuffed the ground for traces of Snowball's footsteps, which he said he could detect by smell. He snuffed in every corner, in the barn, in the cow shed, in the hen houses, in the vegetable garden, and found traces of snowball almost everywhere. He would put his snout to the ground, give several deep sniffs, and exclaim in a terrible voice, snowball, he has been here. I can smell him distinctly. And at the word snowball, all the dogs let out blood curdling growls and showed their side teeth. The animals were thoroughly frightened. It seemed to them as though snowball were some kind of invisible influence pervading the air about them and menacing them 
with all kinds of dangers. In the evening, Squealer called them together and with an alarmed expression on his face, told them that he had some serious news to report. Comrades, cried Squealer, making little nervous skips, a most terrible thing has been discovered. Snowball has sold himself to Frederick at Pinchfield Farm, who is even now plotting to attack us and take our farm away from us. Snowball is to act as his guide when the attack begins, but there is worse than that. We had thought Snowball's rebellion was caused by his vanity and ambition, but we were wrong, comrades. Do you know what the real reason was? Snowball was in league with Jones from the very start. He was Jones's secret agent all the time. It has all been proved by documents which he left behind him and which we have only just discovered. To my mind, this explains a great deal, comrades. Did we not see for ourselves how he attempted, fortunately without success, to get us defeated and destroyed at the Battle of the Cowshed? The animals were stupefied. This was a wickedness far outdoing Snowball's destruction of the windmill, but it was some minutes before they could fully take it in. They all remembered, or thought they remembered, how they had seen Snowball charging ahead of them in the Battle of the Cowshed, how he had rallied and encouraged them at every turn, and how he had not paused for an instant even when the pellets from Jones's gun had wounded his back. At first, it was a little difficult to see how this fitted in with his being on Jones's side. Even Boxer, who seldom asked questions, was puzzled. He lay down, tucked his forehooves beneath him, shut his eyes, and with a hard effort, managed to formulate his thoughts. I do not believe that, he said. Snowball fought bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed. I saw him myself. Did we not give him animal hero first class immediately afterward? That was our mistake, comrade, for we know now, it is all written down in the secret documents that we have found, that in reality, he was trying to lure us to our doom. But he was wounded, said Boxer. We all saw him running with blood. That was part of the arrangement, cried Squealer. Jones's shot only grazed him. I could show you this in his own writing if you were able to read it. The plot was for Snowball at the critical moment to give the signal for flight and leave the field to the enemy. And he very nearly succeeded. I will even say, comrades, he would have succeeded if it had not been for our heroic leader, comrade Napoleon. Do you not remember how, just at the moment when Jones and his men had got inside the yard, Snowball suddenly turned and fled, and many animals followed him? And do you not remember, too, that it was just at that moment, when panic was spreading and all seemed lost, that Comrade Napoleon sprang forward with a cry of death to humanity and sank his teeth in Jones's leg? Surely you remember that comrades, exclaimed Squealer, frisking from side to side. Now when Squealer described the scene so graphically, it seemed to the animals that they did remember it. And at any rate, they remembered that at the critical moment of the battle, Snowball had turned to flee, but Boxer was still a little uneasy. I do not believe that Snowball was a traitor at the beginning, he said finally. What he has done since is different, but I believe that at the Battle of the Cowshed, he was a good comrade. Our leader, Comrade Napoleon, announced Squealer, speaking very slowly and firmly, has stated categorically, categorically, comrade, that Snowball was Jones's agent from the very beginning. Yes, and from long before the rebellion was ever thought of. Ah, that is different, said Boxer. If Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be right. That is the true spirit, Comrade, cried Squealer, but it was noticed he cast a very ugly look at Boxer with his little twinkling eyes.
He turned to go, then paused and added impressively, I warn every animal on this farm to keep his eyes very wide open, for we have reason to think that some of Snowball's secret agents are lurking among us at this very moment. Four days later in the late afternoon, Napoleon ordered all the animals to assemble in the yard. When they were all gathered together, Napoleon emerged from the farmhouse wearing both his medals, for he had recently awarded himself animal hero first class and animal hero second class. With his nine huge dogs frisking around him and uttering growls that sent shivers down all the animal spines, they all cowered silently in their places, seeming to know in advance that some terrible thing was about to happen. Napoleon stood sternly, surveying his audience. Then he uttered a high-pitched whimper. Immediately, the dogs bounded forward, seized four of the pigs by the ear, and dragged them, squealing with pain and terror, to Napoleon's feet. The pigs' ears were bleeding. The dogs had tasted blood, and for a few moments, they appeared to go quite mad. To the amazement of everybody, Three of them flung themselves upon Boxer. Boxer saw them coming, put out his great hoof, caught a dog in midair, and pinned him to the ground. The dog shrieked for mercy, and the other two fled with their tails between their legs. Boxer looked at Napoleon to know whether he should crush the dog to death or let it go. Napoleon appeared to change countenance and sharply ordered Boxer to let the dog go, whereat Boxer lifted his hoof and the dog slunk away, bruised and howling. Presently, the tumult died down. The four pigs waited trembling with guilt written on every line of their countenances. Napoleon now called upon them to confess their crimes. They were the same four pigs as had protested when Napoleon abolished the Sunday meetings. Without any further prompting, they confessed that they had been secretly in touch with Snowball ever since his expulsion, that they had collaborated with him in destroying the windmill, and that they had entered into an agreement with him to hand over Animal Farm to Mr. Frederick. They added that Snowball had privately admitted to them that he had been Jones's secret agent for years. When they had finished their confession, the dogs promptly tore their throats out, and in terrible voice, Napoleon demanded whether any other animals had anything to confess. The three hens in the attempted rebellion over the eggs now came forward and stated that Snowball had appeared to them in a dream and incited them to disobey Napoleon's orders. They too were slaughtered. Then a goose came forward and confessed to having secreted six ears of corn during the last year's harvest and eaten them in the night. Then a sheep confessed to having urinated in the drinking pool, urged to do this, so she said, by Snowball. And two other sheep confessed to having murdered an old ram and especially devoted follower of Napoleon. By chasing him around the bonfire, when he was suffering from a cough. They were all slain on the spot, and so the tale of confessions and executions went on until there was a pile of corpses lying before Napoleon's feet, and the air was heavy with the smell of blood, which had been unknown there since the expulsion of Jones. When it was all over, the remaining animals, except for the pigs and dogs, crept away in a body. They were shaken and miserable. They did not know which was more shocking, the treachery of the animals who had leagued themselves with Snowball or the cruel retribution they had just witnessed. In the old days, there had often been scenes of bloodshed equally terrible, but it seemed to all of them that it was far worse now that it was happening among themselves. Since Jones had left the farm, until today, no animal had killed another animal. Not even a rat had been killed. They had made their way onto the little knoll where the half-finished windmill stood, 
and with one accord, they all lay down as though huddling together for warmth. Clover, Muriel, Benjamin, the cows, the sheep, and a whole flock of geese and hens, everyone, indeed except the cat, who had suddenly disappeared just before Napoleon ordered the animals to assemble. For some time, nobody spoke. Only Boxer remained on his feet. He fidgeted to and fro, switching his long black tail against his sides and occasionally uttering a little whinny of surprise. Finally, he said, I do not understand it. I would not have believed that such things could happen on our farm. It must be due to some fault in ourselves. The solution, as I see it, is to work harder. From now onwards, I shall get up a full hour earlier in the mornings. And he moved off at his lumbering trot and made for the quarry. Having got there, he collected two successive loads of stone and dragged them down to the windmill before retiring for the night. The animals hovered about Clover, not speaking. The knoll where they were lying gave them a wide prospect across the countryside. Most of Animal Farm was within their view. The long pasture stretching down to the main road, the hayfield, the spinney, the drinking pool, the plowed fields where the young wheat was thick and green, and the red roofs of the farm buildings with the smoke curling from the chimneys. It was a clear spring evening. The grass and the bursting hedges were gilded by the level rays of the sun. Never had the farm, and with a kind of surprise, they remembered that it was their own farm, every inch of it their own property, appeared to the animals so desirable a place. As Clover looked down the hillside, her eyes filled with tears. If she could have spoken her thoughts, it would have been to say that this was not what they had aimed at when they had set themselves years ago to work for the overthrow of the human race. These scenes of terror and slaughter were not what they had looked forward to on that night when old Major first stirred them to rebellion. If she herself had had any picture of the future, it had been of a society of animals set free from hunger and the whip, all equal, each working according to his capacity, the strong protecting the weak, as she had protected the last brood of ducklings with her foreleg on the night of Major's speech. Instead, she did not know why they had come to a time when no one dared speak his mind, when fierce growling dogs roamed everywhere, and when you had to watch your comrades torn to pieces after confessing to shocking crimes. There was no thought of rebellion or disobedience in her mind. She knew that even as things were, they were far better off than they had been in the days of Jones, and that before all else, it was needful to prevent the return of the human beings. Whatever happened, she would remain faithful, work hard, carry out the orders that were given to her, and accept the leadership of Napoleon. But still, it was not for this that she and all the other animals had hoped to and toiled it was not for this that they had built the windmill and faced the pellets of Jones's gun. Such were her thoughts, though she lacked the words to express them. At last, feeling this to be in some way a substitute for the words she was unable to find, she began to sing Beasts of England. The other animals sitting round her took it up and they sang it three times over very tunefully, but slowly and mournfully, in a way that it had never been sung before. They had just finished singing it for the third time when Squealer, attended by two dogs, approached them with the air of having something important to say. He announced that, Comrade Napoleon, Beasts of England had been abolished. From now onwards, it was forbidden to sing it. The animals were taken aback. Why, cried Muriel, 
It is no longer needed, comrade, said Squealer stiffly. Beast of England was the song of the rebellion, but the rebellion is now completed. The execution of the traitors this afternoon was the final act. The enemy, both external and internal, has been defeated. In Beasts of England, we expressed our longing for a better society in days to come, but that society has now been established. Clearly, this song has no longer any purpose. Frightened though they were, some of the animals might possibly have protested, but at this moment, the sheep set up their usual bleeding of four legs good, two legs bad, which went on for several minutes and put an end to the discussion. So Beast of England was heard no more. In its place, Minimus, the poet, had composed another song, which began, Animal farm, animal farm, never through me shalt thou come to harm. And this was sung every Sunday morning after the hoisting of the flag but somehow neither the words nor the tune ever seemed to the animals to come up to beasts of England. So concludes chapter seven. I think you're starting to get a hint of what this book is about. However, it was being written between 1933 and 1935 according to the movie Mr. Jones, which I urge everyone to see. Okay, so I have completed chapter seven. There are only three more chapters to go.